if more authors and experts thought of themselves as entrepreneurs in the way that if I bring value, people will be grateful and they'll return that in multiple ways, whether it's through buying my book or promoting the work that I do, more books would be way more successful. Hello, everybody. Super excited to have Jeremy here. He's a senior acquisitions editor at MIT Press, also building science knowledge for kids with MIT Kids Press. He's built an additional business around books on the side called the STEM Book Club. Did I mangle that name or is that? STEM Reads Book Club. <laughs> STEM Reads Book Club. There we go. Yeah. Uh, which is super interesting and bringing a subscription community, ongoing education model to the book world for kids. So much cool stuff and not from a traditional book background. You came out of technology, master's and PhD in chemical engineering. So you've got a fascinating set of experiences. You're right in the heart of it. Cannot wait to learn from you. I, I wanted to start out by just asking you to explain what is an acquisitions editor? How does this part of the publishing world work? I discovered what an acquisitions editor was five years ago. At the time I was a books editor editor for Physics Today magazine. I was the one that would find new books and have them reviewed for the publication. I didn't know who I was communicating with at these publishers. MIT, Oxford, other publishers would send me books. But then I discovered that acquisitions editors are the ones who actually bring in the authors and the books to a press. I think at other publishing houses is commissioning editor. So we either acquire books by reaching out to authors or we reach out to authors and we tell them this is a topic we would like to be written about you are an expert can you write this book so that's a commission book versus an unsolicited proposal coming in through a particular editor my particular list is physical sciences engineering and math so if you're a physicist chemist engineer or mathematician and you want to publish a book with the mit press you'd come to me if you're doing something else maybe environment or computer science you'd go to one of my colleagues and books are considered by many the hit driven industry some books win big and most don't do you have any insight or do you feel like like you're able to read the likely success of a book in advance. One thing I didn't realize about what's important for this particular role that I do is you've got to do a lot of market research. You're pretty much an entrepreneur as an acquisitions editor. So when you see a particular author or topic, you find out how other books with similar platforms have done. So you look at all that and you project sales and you know how big a book will be largely on three metrics, I would say. The author themselves and their profile, their level of expertise the topic itself and the timing. The timing can make a difference. If you publish a book about the James Webb Space Telescope going up in a few months, then you have a much better chance of that being successful compared to publishing it years after. So we do that market research, we make projections, but as you said, Rob, I think what's disappointing is that so many books don't succeed as much as they could. And that's why I love what you're doing because you can form community around nonfiction books. And I don't think a lot of these books that are published do an effective job of forming community and finding the right audience and growing from there. So the big books with the big authors tend to take off and the others, although they have just as much useful stuff and sometimes more, they don't take off. If you could construct your ideal book creation machine or writing machine, what does this look like? Yeah, I think about that quite a bit, but my focus is on finding the right authors and making sure they're writing the right topic. A lot of it is marketing. A lot of it is authors who are willing to do more than what we can do on our own for, for marketing also for research on, on the on the topic ideally what i would like to do is to create a process and a system and i think I, i'm going to work on that in the next few months so authors know this is what the press can do for you this is what you can do for yourself and the book and how the two can align and really be synergistic so that your book is much more successful one example of it is building community early even before the book is written it's so it's powerful it certainly has a time cost it's not easy yeah, to build yeah, a community yeah. But I feel like it's work you were going to have to do anyway if you wanted your book to be successful. Instead of yeah. doing it post-publication as marketing, yeah. you're doing it yeah. pre-publication as community and beta reading. If more authors and experts thought of themselves as entrepreneurs in the way that if I bring value, people will be grateful and they'll return that in multiple ways, whether it's through buying my book or promoting the work that I do, then I think more books would be way more successful. There are a few books in nonfiction science that have been successful that way. One of the most successful books is Seven Brief Lessons on Physics by Carlo Rovelli. 
It's a tiny book, less than a hundred pages, and it's sold so many copies. It costs $20. The reason is because I believe he started by publishing articles in a newspaper. Then he collected those articles. And by that point, there's a community of people who really loved his writing and loved what he was saying about physics and hard topics. And that is an effective way for nonfiction to be published is to have that content out there already. The, the useful books approach is basically trying to maximize iterations in front of real readers. Mm -hmm. I've been interested to hear where this fits in to the, the traditional world or where it doesn't. Is this just a crazy thing we're doing or is this the future of the industry or somewhere in between? <laughs> now, what we do for authors is peer review, even peer review of trade books or books for the general audience. We don't reach out to the intended readers, but we do reach out to writers. If you're writing a, a book about black holes for the general public, I'll find an expert just to make sure that the science is right. I'll find a writer, maybe a physics writer who's not a scientist to make sure that the writing is good. Ideally, it would be good for that material to be read by the intended reader who's not an expert in writing, but right now that's not part of the process. I think most people understand that the values of traditional publishing is the trust. You can skip the trust building process that a self-publisher would have to do by building community and providing that level of value. I have authors who are very shy, don't want to go on social media, but when we publish them, they'll sell more copies than they would on their own because we're basically extending to them our trust. So when the readers see, oh, this is being sold by the MIT press, they trust it more. Is there such thing as a trade math book? I'm fascinated yeah. because I can't even wrap my head around a math book that's not a textbook. But I assume that scholars in the field are publishing monographs and stuff on the topic. My math trade books tend to do better than my physics and engineering trade books because most people who are interested in science and math are aspirational. And I think math is the most aspirational thing to try to understand how a mathematician thinks. It attracts a lot of people. One math trade book that has done very well is called Mage Merlin's Unsolved Mathematical Mysteries. So the authors are mathematicians, but they're also artists. So they did a highly illustrated book about 16 unsolved problems in math. It isn't about the solution, right? It's not about calculating. This book is about telling non-mathematicians that the joy of math comes into tackling really hard problems that you may not get right away, but the process is part of the joy of math. And you'd be surprised how many readers really gravitate to that type of thing. It makes, it makes perfect sense. Steve Strogatz is one of the most popular math writers, Eugenia Chang as well. They don't write a book with the belief that they're going to turn non-mathematicians into mathematicians when they're done. And Rob, that might be an interesting thing to think about. A lot of the books, even useful books, might not be useful in the sense that it'll make you an expert after you read it, but it'll take you a step further. It'll help you appreciate that particular topic a little bit more. That's totally valid because sometimes you have a question and yeah. the usefulness of the book is in answering that question. I have no interest in politics, but when I read the dictator's handbook, I was like, wow, what a delight this book was because this part of the world that typically bores me, I understand it. It's moved my knowledge forward. It's quite a trick though when people can pull that off. It takes a talented writer and editor and I guess whole team. I think about writing books too. Think about it. Every year there's a handful of celebrated writing guides. How can this be if there's already these excellent things that exist? There's still new yeah. ones. So it's definitely aspirational, right? Most people, I assume they're buying it because they think that it will put them on the path to getting closer or potentially publishing at a high level. What are your thoughts on business model and profitability and reliability as an author? In the traditional publishing world, you're either not thinking about making a living from it because most of my authors are full-time professors. They're not thinking about that. The book is really giving them more credibility. Some of my authors do want to make a living from this. In that case, they try to write on a topic that will be a big seller, get a large advance and really build their profile that way and build their potential readership that way. For a self-published book, the more useful the book is, I think the more you can charge and you can do exactly what I think most of you are doing, which is create a community and treat it almost in a sense like a software, something that's useful, something that you can use, something that can update in real time. You want to price the book relative to what competitors are selling their book. Uh, illustrated books, people are willing to pay more, sometimes even a little higher if it's very well packaged, the quality of the book feels right. But I don't think for aspirational and inspirational books that you have as much wiggle room because people aren't going to pay $60, $70 for an inspirational book. I paid, I think, $100 for Steph Smith's doing content. You're bringing that kind of value and maybe she makes a big update and next year she charges for that. And I pay for it because I've got so much utility. Right. That's more 
practical, more action oriented. So I'm willing to pay that sort of the price for the course. But for these types of books, you have to price it relative to what other books are selling for. I think that's a great answer. In some niches, the book feels like a commodity and in others, it feels very unique and impossible. And you yeah. get like these monopoly pricing effects. With my business, STEM Reads Book Club, I'm not really publishing books. I'm promoting books. The subscription model that I'm thinking about is more like Blinkist. I'm providing summaries. I'm providing value on a bunch of different topics within a particular niche. So I am focused on children's STEM books, on teachers and parents who want kids to love STEM them to understand STEM topics. I'm making a bet that they might be willing to pay for summaries and resources around that particular niche of a book. Curation is huge. I came up in the traditional model of you become an expert by getting a degree. <laughs> and you don't have any value unless you're the one that's originating an idea. But that's totally false. In fact, all books are mostly curation with some maybe original ideas, and that's not even necessary. You save people a lot of time, you bring them a lot of value if you curate. Absolutely. At a certain point, especially for business customers, the value of the book is the time it saves them and the uncertainty yeah. it saves them and you know, yeah. curation. So when you get a book idea on your desk, what are yeah. the main things that will turn you off it? Like the main warning flags that make you think, I don't want to take this idea any further. When the author thinks there's no book like it, <laughs> we ask them questions in our proposal guidelines. What are the competing books or what books is it similar to? And we'll tell them, even if it's not in your domain, what's another book that taking the same approach. And when an author is not thinking about that, it means that they think what they have is better than it really is. <laughs> and yeah, the writing is important. Maybe not as important as people think, especially for nonfiction books. But if the person is not really a good writer, it doesn't keep people reading all the way to the end. And if that person is famous and we give them a contract because we think the book will still sell well because they have an original idea and they already have a platform for it, it makes me nervous when they're not a good writer. And that's why we'll hire developmental editors for some of those books. What's an early sign where you see it and you're like, wow, this is exciting. I think really understanding what your list is. When I say your list, I mean, who are the type of people that gravitate to the brand MIT Press? What are they looking for from us? One of my most successful books is called The Atom. It's a visual tour of The Atom. I knew that was going to work for us because going back to the word aspirational, there are a lot of people who buy books that we publish because they want to learn some of the hard science, but they're not scientists per se. I've since then done several other books, a lot of illustrations paired with the hard science or the hard math. So that model has been working for us. And if I see someone else come and they have a similar model, that's an early sign that it, it could do well. I think for us, compared to most academic presses, we do a lot of trade books that a lot of other academic presses won't take, like those visual ones. I did a graphic novel, The Dialogues by Clifford Johnson, a string theorist and illustrated by him as well. A lot of other big academic presses passed on. He lives in California and he's consulted Marvel on a lot of their Avenger movies. And he doesn't have the hugest platform on social media, but he's connected enough that when that book came out, people were excited about it, and it's so different. So again, back to my thesis that illustrated books are going to be big in science. It makes it more approachable for people who want to learn a little bit about some of these types. I was reading an opinion piece about someone who's been quite successful in business writing, and one of his big like secrets or insights was basically just doing the opposite of your genre's conventions. Yeah, I remember yeah. reading a comic book version of the Tao Te Ching. It was like comic book philosophy. It was so <laughs> pleasant. I read it as a teenager. I tried to read it before is just a book and it was impenetrable. And suddenly as a comic book, it became one of my absolute favorites. And then afterwards I found I could go back to the real translations and actually unlocked this whole interesting slice of philosophy for me. When you're a writer and a publisher, you really have to think about how different people absorb information in different ways. And if you can reach all those audiences in the ways they prefer, whether it's illustrated, audio, video, that could be something that the future of publishing will be showing. We can do content in different ways not just text and you'll get more people gravitate. Let's talk post-launch for a, a little bit. I know you mostly deal with the books at the very beginning. What should an author be doing post-launch? Is there something or is a book's fate sealed at the published date? The difference between books and a blog post is the book should have a long tail. If a book doesn't have a long tail, then maybe it shouldn't have been written as a book. <laughs> Authors should be thinking that it might take years for my book to catch on. So I should be doing work around that book. We talked to Jeff Godel from Sensor Response Press 
They published about 30 books. He says the authors who write and then just, well, I'm done. Almost always those books fail. Whereas the authors who are like, I've planted a flag in a space and now I'm going to build a career, build a reputation, continue working in those space. That Those books succeed. In 1994, in high school, I read Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And that's what really got me turned onto nonfiction. At the time I was reading Hardy Boys, I loved fiction. When I read that book, I was thinking about what my life would be. And the reason why I continued to read that book and follow its lessons was Stephen Covey, the author. He created a company around planners. He was putting out content on video, audio courses, different things like that. That kept me interested in his ideas and his subsequent books. And in returning to that same book, if if you don't do that, your book won't have the same impact. You mentioned Atomic Habits when you were talking to Cortland Allen. I didn't know anything about Clear or that book. I just sort of stumbled on it in the middle of the pandemic. It would have succeeded without all the stuff that he's been doing. But at but the it, same it time- It wouldn't have sold 10 million copies or whatever he sold. <laughs> even though it's an excellent book. So marketing is so huge in writing because if people don't know about it, it just won't succeed. So you have to get attention to it and you can't just throw money at it. He attracted to the book with the marketing that he was doing and the reviews were positive and I bought it. The marketing is extremely important. Traditional publishing royalties. So <laughs> like 12, 12% 12 feels low, sometimes 8%, maybe 15. What's the industry view? I, I like being vulnerable, but I'm not going to fully <laughs> share my thoughts on this one because <laughs> I am still working. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I will say that it's relatively fair for an author. They're getting that transferred value and trust uh, that I mentioned earlier. So they're exchanging that for maybe a more aggressive royalty share with the publisher. But for authors who are doing a lot of the work that maybe are more effective than we are with marketing their book and editing it, maybe it's not as fair. That's a, a very reasonable answer. I'd always assume that publishers have these big, heavy cost structures. And actually there's not that much wiggle room in the finances. So much goes into the printing. The operational stuff there's not but for an author and a topic we think was going to be really big we'll make an investment large advance large royalties relatively larger than we would do because we think down the road we'll get that author to write another big book we'll attract more big authors so there's some big bets that are made but most books not a lot of wiggle room what percentage of your list did you recruit and what percentage came to you by submitting something. I'd also be curious to know what percentage of submissions make it through at MIT. So for the latter question, it depends on the list. For my list, it's probably relatively higher than computer science. They get maybe thousand unsolicited submissions every year because we're well known for that particular topic. Maybe only 10, 15%. They can be more picky. I can't be as picky. So maybe 40% of submissions I might accept. Maybe it's, maybe it's not that high. I do get a good number of really, what's the word, a nutty proposals from people who want to say Einstein was wrong. So if I throw those in the mix, it's really low. It's like 10%. We weren't publishing as much in physics and chemistry until I got there five years ago. Maybe in the next two, three years, it'll drop in terms of the percentage of unsolicited. In terms of how many authors of mine I recruited, probably close to 60% of what I've published. I drew a lot from my background. I just came out of a totally different industry into publishing. And so I was able to use my network, being an editor for a physics magazine, being a scientist, I drew on that network. One of my first authors was my PhD advisor. <laughs> so people that I drew from my own networks. What does the research process look like if you're trying to figure out the potential of a particular book idea? What, what data are you pulling? If there's a topic that we see that's trending in academia, whether it's a textbook or a book for professionals, we look at talks that are being given on a topic at a conference. We'll say, okay, we're seeing more and more talks on that topic. Maybe interest in that topic is growing and we don't quantify it very rigorously. It's mostly qualitative. Once we decide that we're considering a particular book, we look at book sales of similar books and we project that way. We look at the, the size of the market, how many courses are being taught on that topic, how many universities are teaching on that topic. And it gets a little bit more quantitative. If it's a trade book, I look online, I look at social media, I see this scientist, people are following her and she's tweeting about, let's say astronomy. I look at other people people maybe blogging or talking about the same thing. And I qualitatively say, this could be a book. There's a market for it. I draw from my previous experience as a scientist and as a science writer. I know this is an important topic like fusion. I'm publishing a book on fusion next year. MIT and I and just announced a huge breakthrough in fusion. Exactly. And I acquired this book three years ago before this breakthrough came because I knew the breakthroughs on the horizon and it was worth publishing a book on fusion. That's one I'm excited to read. I, I got into the YouTube fusion rabbit hole. Like 
like two days ago. I was watching all these <laughs> lectures that came out of MIT. And that one you've got real monopoly power over because the research is from MIT. There are a lot of people doing on Fusion, but I think the PR from MIT is pretty strong too. They are the leader in commercial Fusion. In the community, this question keeps coming up and I've never had a good answer. It's an author I'm trying to decide, is there a market for this? Is it good if there's huge books selling tons of copies? Is that competition or is that a sign that the market's big? There are two different types of books. There are useful books where there's going to be an audience and then there are books that are not quite as useful. You should think how many people are willing to buy an aspirational book about a topic that maybe there's not a lot of interest in. If it's a useful approach that you want to take on a pretty narrow problem for a particular group of people, you don't have to worry that there's no one else writing about it because someone might be trying to solve it in a different way. Maybe there's a lot of Reddit discussion around that topic and people haven't written a book about it. So you could be the first to write a book about it. Makes sense. Harriet, you want to jump in here? You came out of the traditional publishing world. Now you're helping indies. I, I feel like we're about to pick a fight. Let's do it. <laughs> I don't want to be combative in any way, but I'm just interested to know if you think traditional publishing is threatened by indie publishing. I don't think so. I think the trust thing is huge for people, especially for books that are not purely practical and there's some aspiration and inspiration people are looking for. I think traditional publishers offer a level of credibility and brand that is still going to be useful for readers who don't know the particular author. What I think traditional publishers need to do quickly is figure out how to reach people who absorb content differently. It can't just be printed books. I believe that soon publishers are going to have to be publishing in other ways to be more diverse in the way they distribute. That's a great point because I've noticed with my readers, readers in air quotes, they, they don't read the book. They do the Udemy course or audiobook and book are very close. They're like siblings. Whereas the, the, the course, it's not the same. It's going to be different content. It's delivered in a different way, but that's like a cousin, but it's still the same value that's getting delivered. When we sign a book, the author chooses what type of rights to give us. Often we get all of that and we have the right to license it, to make courses from it. We'll tell the authors in advance, this is how much you can get from sales if we create some other type of product or we license it to make a movie or something like that. Some authors withhold those rights because they want to sell those licenses themselves. You've seen this whole industry, you're right at the heart of it. What do authors misunderstand that they should know about the industry? If you're thinking about publishing with a traditional publisher versus self-publishing. I think most authors already know the trade-offs. You may not make as much money, but I think you establish yourself a bit faster with people who don't know you. A few years ago, I wrote an article for Physics Today about the fact that a lot of scientists are choosing to self-publish their textbooks because they didn't like the, the royalty split for one. Secondly, they didn't like the pricing. They wanted to sell their books a lot cheaper. They wanted to sell $30 textbooks when everyone knows the textbook prices have been skyrocketing rocketing, $150 textbooks. So you can get control over that and still make more money self-publishing. But if you publish a textbook, there's not as many people that would trust it, especially if they don't know you or have taken a course from you on that topic in a traditional university. My takeaway message is keep doing what you're doing. I love Rob's approach, reaching out to your audience before you publish the book and keep learning. Don't compare yourself to other successful authors. There's so many different paths to success in publishing. You got to play it alone game with publishing. The comparisons is such a good point. It, it really challenged me when I was writing Write Useful Books because I was looking for examples. I want to learn from successful books. So I'll look at the ones with the highest sales numbers. Yeah. But actually there's so many confounding factors. What's their platform? What's their fame? What's their network? It's hard to extract the causality from the final result. And I liked what you said earlier about authors treating it as a career path where they're looking at the next several books and each book is likely to get a little bit more successful. You get a better advance. I heard this from Ryan Holiday. He said that with his first book, the publishers didn't know who he was. He was an internet stranger. He felt lucky to get any deal at all. By his fourth book, he was saying, I need this. And the publishers were saying, yes, we will give you that. Because uh, he was yeah. like, he was building on those successes and de-risking himself. I have a contract with Indiana University Press. I just submitted my files yesterday. The book is coming out in the fall. I probably won't make a dime from it. Royalties are not great. There was no advance, but it's an adjunct to, I think, my career. And it's a passion project as well. But I think it'll help launch me to doing other books. Or if I do a book, 
through your useful books, hopefully it will help me foster a larger platform that I can use. Well, I think you're writing a cult classic, Adam. It's going to surprise you. I thought I was only going to write one. And then as the years passed, I found myself with new learnings and new ideas. And I'm like, well, I learned something interesting. I got to write about it. I keep being surprised. Every time I start, I say never again. And then a year later, you know, what can you do? Jeremy, we're coming to the end of the hour. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to hear the insider's perspective. Where can we follow you, support you, learn more from you? I'm at JNA Matthews on Twitter and on LinkedIn. As I told Rob before, my DMs are open on both Twitter and LinkedIn, and I'm happy to answer questions. I just love learning from people by sharing what I know and learning from what they know. So happy to keep the conversation going one-on-one. -on -one. That's very generous of you. We appreciate it. Yeah.